Good day, everyone. I'm Dr. Reyes, and today I'll talk about hypertension in pregnancy. And this is an important topic because the urgency in management of hypertension in pregnancy is very different from that of non-pregnant patients in adult medicine. So I'd like to start today's um, lecture with a simple case. We have here a 26-year-old G2P1 with an OV score of 1001 at 34 weeks age of gestation. She came in for her antenatal checkup and her vital signs are as follows. So she's got a BP of 170 over 110, a pulse rate of 95, a respiratory rate of 19, temperature of 36.5, an O2 saturation of 99, and physical exam reveals fetal edema up to the calf. Our question asks us what the next best step in management is. So I'll give you a few seconds to read over the choices before we continue. So our question asks for the next best step. Before we can decide on the management, we must first correctly diagnose our patient. And given the name of today's topic and the patient's very elevated blood pressure, it's easy to write it off as hypertension in pregnancy. So let's first define hypertension in um, pregnancy uh, by going through the terminology. So hypertension in pregnancy is defined as having a systolic BP of more than or equal to 140 and or a diastolic BP of more than or equal to 90. This must be the case in two separate occasions and this must be measured at least four hours apart. But does the definition stop here? Actually, it doesn't. There um, are further classifications of um, hypertension in pregnancy, and this is um, gestational hypertension, chronic hypertension, preeclampsia, and eclampsia. So I've put it in a table here so that it's a bit easier to compare. So gestational hypertension is hypertension um, induced by pregnancy. Now this has to be diagnosed after 20 weeks age of gestation and it should resolve within three months. There is no proteinuria and no eclampsia. Uh, as compared to chronic hypertension, which is pre-existing hypertension, so this is before uh, 20 weeks age of gestation and it uh, persists after three months postpartum. There's also no proteinuria and no eclampsia here. Preeclampsia, on the other hand, is a hypertension that is after 20 weeks age of gestation. What's the difference here? There is either new onset proteinuria or other new onset conditions, which we'll talk about a little later. This can be with or without severe features. Eclampsia, uh, is a complication of preeclampsia and it's characterized by new onset grand mal seizures or unexplained coma. So the other um, classifications are a, a little bit clear. Let's talk a bit more about preeclampsia. Um, so again, preeclampsia is when a woman has hypertension in pregnancy after 20 weeks age of gestation. But is proteinuria uh, required to make the diagnosis? The answer is no. So preeclampsia can be defined as a BP of more than or equal to 140 over 90, accompanied by new onset proteinuria. But it can also be diagnosed if there's a presence of one or more new onset maternal organ involvement, such as renal insufficiency, liver involvement, neurologic complications, and hematologic complications. So renal involvement could be in the form of proteinuria, elevated creatinine, or oliguria. Liver involvement could be raised serum transaminases or clinically if there's severe epigastric pain or right upper quadrant pain. Neurological involvement could be a headache, visual disturbances, hyperreflexia, or convulsions. And hematologic involvement could be seen as thrombocytopenia, hemolysis, such as increased LDH or DIC. It could also be diagnosed if there's elevated BP accompanied by uteroplacental dysfunction. So this is seen as fetal growth restriction or abruption. So preeclampsia can be further classified as preeclampsia without severe features and preeclampsia with severe features. So severe features of preeclampsia include the following listed here. So a hypertension more than or equal to 160 over 110, 
thrombocytopenia, impaired liver function, progressive renal insufficiency, pulmonary edema, new onset headaches or visual disturbances, HELP syndrome, and eclampsia. So HELP syndrome stands for um, hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. So any woman diagnosed with new onset hypertension after 20, 20, 20 weeks age of gestation should be assessed for risk factors and signs and symptoms of preeclampsia. So why do we have to look for these things? So we must look for risk factors because if they are present, we can start preventive measures. Risk factors include a history of preeclampsia or help if they already have chronic hypertension, if they have diabetes, renal disease, autoimmune diseases, family history, or if they've had oocyte donations. So guidelines state that women who are at high risk are recommended to start on low-dose aspirin and calcium before 16 weeks to reduce the risk of developing preeclampsia and adverse events such as preterm birth. So we, we need to look for, for risk factors so that we can start preventive measures. Why do we need to look for signs and symptoms? Because patients with preeclampsia should be uh, managed as inpatients. They need to be admitted. So initially, assessment and management in a day assessment unit at home and BP monitoring may be appropriate. However, again, it is important to look for signs and symptoms of preeclampsia because they need to be managed as inpatients. So the following investigations should be ordered if uh, the patient comes in with new onset hypertension after 20 weeks. But if features of preeclampsia are present, additional investigations should include the following, urinalysis, coagulation studies, blood film, LDH, and fibrinogen. So let's talk about management now. So before we can manage, we have to define our goals. The cardinal principles of management are to control the hypertension, to prevent convulsion, convulsions, and to deliver it at an optimum time and mode. So for BP control, guidelines suggest that women who develop severe hypertension should be treated with antihypertensives, and treatment should be considered in patients who have gestational hypertension. First-line antihypertensive um, would be the following, labetalol, nifedipine, and methyl dopa. Uh, methyl dopa is usually the agent of choice, and we should remember that ACE inhibitors and ARBs are contraindicated in pregnancy. They are considered teratogenic. This is in contrast to the management of non-pregnant uh, hypertensive patients where ACE inhibitors and um, ARBs are acceptable first-line agents. So we must remember that in pregnant patients, we cannot give these medications. And these antihypertensives are given to reach a target BP of 130 to 150 over 80 to 100. For women with severe hypertension or a BP of more than 160 over 110, um, we have to lower the BP a little bit faster. So that involves the use of parenteral medications. And commonly used agents include intravenous labetalol, intravenous nifedipine, intravenous hydralazine. And just remember that when you're using hydralazine, you should consider giving an IV bolus of a crystalloid with the first dose. This is usually less than 500 milliliters. So again, just to emphasize, um, patients with preeclampsia are admitted and managed as inpatients for the administration of these parenteral drugs and so that they can be observed a little bit closer. Apart from controlling the blood pressure, we mentioned that the other goal is to prevent convulsions. This is because there is an imminent risk of eclampsia. So the agent used for neuroprotection is magnesium sulfate, and it uh, guidelines say that it is indicated for women with eclampsia and considered in, for women um, with pre, severe preeclampsia 
but th they emphasize that the primary importance is the BP control. So lastly, we need to deliver the baby in an optimal time. And when we decide the time of the delivery, we have to consider a few things, such as the severity of the hypertensive disease, the age of gestation, and the maternal and fetal well-being. Um, so the guidelines suggest that the preferred mode of delivery is vaginal unless it's contraindicated. So simply put, if there are no severe features um, and the baby is less than 37 weeks, we initiate expectant management. So this includes monitoring, we consider neuroprotection with magnesium sulfate, we treat the hypertension, and we administer corticosteroids for lung maturation. But if the baby is more than 37 weeks, we can already deliver. And then if there are severe features or if there's HELP syndrome, it depends on the age again. If it is more than 34 weeks, we deliver after maternal stabilization. And if it is less than, we have to um, make sure that the facility has adequate uh, resources before we, can, uh, we continue the delivery. So this is just from the textbook. It is a summary of what we've discussed for the management of severe preeclampsia. Let's go back to our case. So I've highlighted here our salient features. We have a patient, 34 weeks, with a very high BP of 170 over 110, and she already has fetal edema. So what I like to do when I answer questions is to eliminate, to make this uh, easier. So we have here a patient who's 34 weeks. She has a BP of 170 over 110, very high already, and she has pedal edema. The pedal edema and the high BP would lead me to believe that there's already preeclampsia here. The edema is probably caused by um, renal insufficiency and proteinuria. So the protein would be leaving the body um, and uh, causing, it causes the edema. So would we still observe in a day assessment unit for BP monitoring? No, we would not. We would have to admit this patient because the patient is um, considered to have preeclampsia already. Start on low dose aspirin and calcium. So this is correct if the patient has risk factors for preeclampsia, but is prevention, does prevention still have a role here? The patient already has signs and symptoms of preeclampsia. So we would not start on low dose aspirin and calcium, plus the patient is already at 34 weeks. So we can cross that out. We are left with three choices, all for admission, which is what we're looking for. We just differ here in the medication that's given. So we can either start on methyl dopa, start on IV hydralazine and crystalloids, and start on magnesium sulfate for neuroprotection. All are correct, but what's the best answer here? So our patient's BP is already 170 over 110. Well, we can give magnesium sulfate for neuroprotection, but guidelines suggest that um, our primary um, goal here is to control the BP first. So we can cross out magnesium sulfate for neuroprotection. We're left with two choices, both um, with antihypertensive medication, but which is better? The patient's BP is already 170 over 110. This calls for a more urgent or faster way to control the BP. What's the faster way to control the BP? Is through parenteral medication. So there is a parenteral form of methyl dopa, but it's not listed here if it's IV or not. So we can cross that one out and we're left with Admit and start on IV hydralazine and crystalloid. That would be our correct answer because the patient um, already has preeclampsia. We admit the patient has a BP of 170 over 110, so we need to acutely lower their blood pressure. That's why we start on IV hydralazine and crystalloids. So I hope you guys got that lecture. Um, these are my references. Um, so if you guys have any questions, feel free to message. And thank you so much. That's it for today.